"'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the lab, "'the scientists were working, using fab after fab. "'The chromatography columns were hung from their clamps with great care, "'with hope that their protein soon would be there. "'The mice were all nestled in their cages asleep, "'their tumors quietly growing, without even a peep. "'The cell cultures whirled and frothed on the shakers, "'hexcells dividing, producing protein, like tiny little bakers.' Down through the fume hoods there arose such a clatter, the scientists came running, their minds all a-scatter. Did I leave the sash open? wondered Mary, her eyes open wide. Did I leave the vacuum on? Sam pondered, dropping his slide. Well, up on the roof, gleaming white in the snow, silhouetted against the lights of the city below, what to your wondering eyes would appear but a giant effing sleigh and nine glowing reindeer? With a little old driver so lively and quick, you would know in a moment it must be St. Nick. And then in a twinkling, the scientists heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each green fluorescent hoof. As they looked at each other and looked all around, down the fume hood, St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and they laughed when they saw him in spite of themselves. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave them to know they had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, and emptied his bag on the bench with a jerk and laying a finger aside of his nose, and giving a nod up the fume hood he rose. The scientists sprang on their loot with glee and delight. Look, Mary shouted, holding a tube up to the light. Her protein was there, labeled with nice, neat writing, and Joe held a mouse with a phenotype he'd been fighting. For St. Nick had bestowed the most elusive gift, true results that replicate, and your soul uplift. And the scientists laughed and hugged with joy, and even old Sam felt like he had as a boy. And St. Nick sprang to his sleigh, to his team, gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But they heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Merry Crispermas to all, and to all a good night. The self-control of maintaining your composure while being kicked and punched at was it's a good kind of like being in grad school yeah how that was kicked and punched <laughs> that was directly transferable welcome to hello phd a podcast for scientists and the people who love them this week on the show we celebrate the season and share some tips for staying healthy and productive in lab stay with us And we're back. This is Hello PhD episode 25. I'm Joshua Hall. And I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Dan, that was Twas the Night Before Crispermas, a poem uh, picked up off the Lab Rats subreddit. Ooh, I love Reddit. This is great. Are you a Reddit fan? Uh, I am only recently a Reddit fan. I wish I had known about it a lot sooner. Um, I always thought of Reddit as like this weird place that weird people went to do weird, you know, I didn't know what it was about, but then you discover like, oh, there's a whole group of people talking about this random obscure topic I love. And, and it is very cool. Front page of the internet. That's what they call That's it. They say, but, but this Lab Rats Reddit has been a favorite of mine recently because it lets me relive some of the old lab days. They're extremely helpful. Yeah. It seems like there are things from people sharing their experiences all the way to people getting tips on methods and techniques. So yeah, it seems absolutely. like a cool community. We'll post a link to it in the show notes. And actually, Dan, we'll revisit this a little later because we actually probed the Redditors from the Lab Rat subreddit to help us with our topic today. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, Dan, because today I have a special beer for us to try. It's got a cow. It's got, got a cow. scarf on. You know, I saw this one, Dan, and I knew I had to get it for the show. Um, I figure you're going to roll your eyes on this one, but this is actually a crossover beer. I guess this is a collaboration beer, you might call it, between New Belgium Brewing, who you've okay. probably heard of. The, the makers of Fat Tire and several other fine beers. That is correct, who now uh, actually brew in North Carolina. I don't know if you knew that. And Ben and Jerry's. That is an ice cream maker. That's right. So this is a, a collaboration between New Belgium Brewery and Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream Maker, and this is the Salted Caramel Brownie Brown Ale. Is this going to violate my rule of not <laughs> drinking beers that taste like cake? Yeah. I, I, when I saw this, my first thought was not, oh, this is something Dan would get, but I thought this was so crazy, I had to try it. 
Okay, well, let's give it a try. Yeah, let's try this. It is actually not overwhelmingly uh, cakey, so that is a, a major point in its favor. Well, you know, Dan, uh, the fact that it was New Belgium, I like most of the things they put out, so I trusted that it was not going to be disgusting, but this is actually pretty good. Yeah, I think they um, they probably use the Ben and Jerry's for marketing, but I, I it's not I'm not picking up like crazy brownie flavors. I don't think they added a lot of weird stuff to it. Not getting any salt, not getting any maybe a little caramel. Yeah, it's a little bit sweet. There is a little bit of a chocolate note to Sweeter it. Sweeter than the bad penny brown ale we had last. I don't know if it week. actually has any of these flavors or because they suggest it, and I'm in the frame of mind to expect it. Maybe it tastes like that. But that's actually a good experiment. We should make some labels where we put some fake flavor names and see if you can detect those flavors by merely suggesting them. We'll put an IPA in there. Hey, do you taste chocolate and pine nuts? <laughs> this is the Hawaiian Pizza Imperial IPA. Delicious. <laughs> oh, I taste the pineapple. Where can I get some? <laughs> All right. Well, shall we get to this week's topic? Yeah. So we had a listener question, Dan. Why don't you read it? Okay. Um, so this question came from, well, the name is right in there, so I'll just read it out. Hello, my name is Andy, and I'm a postdoc at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. I love your podcast, and I wish I had something like it when I was a graduate student. I had one idea for a future topic, which was something that I struggled with during graduate school, your physical health during your PhD years. It is not the most endearing of topics, but it's honest. Finding time to decompress, work out, and enjoy life in grad school can be really challenging, but not impossible. Best wishes, and keep up the awesome. Sincerely, Andy. What a great question. Very, very good question. This is... Um, so, so important. I've often said that grad school is a marathon, not a sprint. And to complete a marathon, you better stay in shape. Yes, yeah, so today I'm glad we're talking about this now towards the end of the year. We got the new year on the horizon. And that's often when people talk about turning over some new leaves, building some new habits. Uh, exercise can often be one of them. Physical activity, taking care of your health. And, you know, next week, Dan, we're going to talk about some ways to keep perspective in graduate school. Um but today, let's look at one specific part um, of her question, because she meant to mention decompressing, working out, just in generally enjoying life while in grad school. But let's talk about specifically how to find time to take care of your physical health during grad school. Yeah, really, really valuable. And the first piece of that, I think, is uh, exercise and keeping your body healthy. Yeah, and Dan, I guess we should you know start at the beginning. Um, why does it matter at all? Why try to get exercise during grad school? I mean, you're busy. Why take time to do that? That's a good point, Josh. Let's move on to the next question. It sounds too hard. I just, <laughs> I'm just gonna give up right now. Well, I actually didn't know off the top of my head, other than well, it sounds like a good idea. Uh, but we wanted to go a little beyond that, so I poked around a little bit and found some research uh, that the Harvard Business Review did uh, back in 2014. And so, basically, what they did was they had a study where researchers looked at over 200 employees at a variety of companies, and what they did was they self-reported their performance on a daily basis. And so they examined fluctuations within individual employees. Okay, Wait, 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 wait. They self-reported their job performance? Great. A plus, A plus, A plus, <laughs> A plus. Who's going to self-report that they're doing a maybe, terrible job? Maybe they signed off, or at least were told this would not go to your supervisor. Yeah, if but, it's anonymous, they may be more honest. Yeah. Uh, but what they did was they wanted to look at fluctuations within individual employees that compared their output on days when they exercised compared to days when they didn't exercise. And so what they found was probably what they expected to find. That was on days when employees visited the gym, their experience at work changed, and they reported that they managed their time more effectively. They were more productive. And I thought this was interesting. They also felt they had smoother interactions with their colleagues and just as important, if not more important, they went home feeling more satisfied at the end of the day. Oh, that's great. And and I can imagine some of these being uh, very valuable to graduate students. I mean, managing my time, getting along with my lab mates. Absolutely, Dan. I mean, these are a lot of themes, a lot of issues that can crop up in a lot of jobs, but especially grad school. And so their summary um, at the end of this article was, studies show that besides the physical benefits to exercise, there are cognitive benefits as well that you can expect by incorporating regular exercise into whatever your routine is. And that includes improved concentration, a sharper memory, faster learning, prolonged mental stamina, enhanced creativity, lower stress, and then of course, importantly, an elevated mood 
Yes, please, to that entire list. Yeah, so, you know, these are all great things. So then the question is... No one's found that exercise makes you really sad and boring and have a terrible life. Nobody's found that yet. But, you know, exercise is like a lot of things, Dan. You know, we all on one level can say, yeah, exercise, that's a good thing. That's going to be beneficial to us in a lot of ways. So why don't we just do it? Because it doesn't feel good all the time. Well, I think that could be. And then especially for graduate students, postdocs, and and a lot of us, time is seen as a very finite resource. And so I think a lot of times exercise falls into one of these categories that feels like a luxury, right? And so we say we don't have time to exercise. We've got papers to write, experiments to do, uh, expectations of our PI to to try to satisfy. And, you know, to be fair, this is a legitimate explanation. Okay. There are lots of times we feel overwhelmed. and can't imagine fitting in something else, but what, what we mean here, and this is actually something they discussed in the article is when we say we don't have time for something, what we're actually saying is we don't consider it a priority given the time that we have available. Okay. So one way though, we could maybe shift our focus is instead of perceiving exercise or physical activity, if it really has all these benefits, it's not perceive it as a luxury to fit in, but as actually something that's part of our work itself. So plan for it at the beginning of the day, not as a, oh, if I happen to have some time, maybe I'll try to go exercise. Yeah. And, you know, I think, again, if we look to industry, especially places where uh, job satisfaction is really high, I think they've tapped into this a little bit. I know I have friends who work in industry, who, as part of the culture of that workplace, if they have incorporate exercise into their lunch break, they can have a longer lunch break, right? Or that's included as, you know, their gym facilities on their campus or physical activity is made easier for their employees to take advantage of. Yeah, that makes sense. At my office, uh, everybody goes and does CrossFit Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoon. Oh, not everybody, but a lot of people do. <laughs> Including you, Dan, right? I, I have done it on occasion, <laughs> yeah. not recently. Yeah. Actually, we're going to talk in just a minute to a grad student who's big into CrossFit. Awesome. I have to kind of throw in here that I think lab is more physical than a lot of jobs. So when I finished my, my PhD and I went and took a desk job, I remember those first few weeks of sitting at this desk at a computer and my legs would start to like twitch Oh yeah, and they'd start to tap. And I, I would just like, I would feel that I had to get up and do something because when you're in lab, you're running up the hall and you go to the cold room and then you check by the coffee pot and you, you know, go back to your desk and look at the computer and then you're carrying something to, you know, you're constantly on the move. Um, and it's weird to sit in a cube, yeah, you know, a cubicle and just sit. Well, and you're standing a lot doing experiments at your lab bench. You're yep. very seldom just sitting for long periods. The of time. water bath is nowhere near the fridge. I mean, you're yeah. just always moving. And so, um, I would I would just like have to move, and so I'd go run up and downstairs. Now I actually do my work on my computer, but I have a treadmill under the desk, and I'm walking all the time. Interesting. So that's a good tip. Yeah. Well, there's a tip if you are <laughs> if a, you can drag a treadmill into yeah, your lab. I got it on Craigslist, uh, and I have a tall desk from the container store. So there you go. There's a tip. But I don't know that a lot of grad students are in desk type jobs. I guess people in computational biology or some other things, maybe. Yeah. You know, Dan, I have one of those, one of those fancy wrist step counters now. And I wish I would have had one in grad school because I think you're absolutely right. I think it would be amazing how many steps I would accumulate just during the normal course of my day while in the lab. Yeah. People who have uh, pedometers tweet to us, or if your phone counts your steps, I'd love to hear kind of an average amount of steps that a grad student or a postdoc takes during the day. Yeah. Just on a normal lab day. Uh, So Dan, what we did... Two uh, steps from my car to the desk. (laughs) Well, I would say, Dan, um, you know, I feel like I get a lot more physical activity now than I did when I was a graduate student. And I know we hung out quite a bit and that was never in the gym. It was more often at the bar or... (laughs) I will run, but only if something's chasing me. And then I'm going to do the math on whether I think it's probably going to catch me, and I might just stop. You don't have to be able to outrun what's chasing you. You only need to be able to outrun the guy next to you. Well, you're going to you're gonna win then. So, Dan, what I thought we could do, since we are by no means experts in this topic, is let's talk to a couple grad students that, that really have done a good job at incorporating physical activity into their training. Sounds good. My name is Nadia Khan. I'm a third-year grad student in the Cell Molecular Biology graduate program at University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I do a type of exercise um, called CrossFit that mainly consists of, it's a cardio-based workout 
that includes um, weights, and those weights can vary from day to day. Either the scheme is high repetition and low weight, or sometimes it can be high weight and low repetitions, but there's always variability from day to day, um, and it's usually in a class setting, so you have multiple people with you. Um, you usually are not making up the workout on the spot. It's decided for you before you even come. Um, and it's a really good way to, like, make friends outside of lab. Oftentimes, I can get in this, like, little corner where all I talk to is my lab. So <laughs> it's really nice to, like, remind myself that there's people who exist in the city other than science people <laughs> and people trying to do research. And then the other form of exercise I do is something called Olympic weightlifting. I, I do it personally for competition reasons, and the reason why is n not because I'm, like, a aggressive competitive person, but it's because I feel that when I set a goal other than my lab priorities and other than school, I'm a lot happier versus when I don't have a goal. And it really just helps to take my mind off of the stress of grad school, the stress of not getting stuff right. So it, it sort of distracts me from all that stress that I then dive into when I go into the work day every day. Um, because it, it gives me something else to focus on, something else to, like, constantly improve on and constantly strive for. And uh, I've, I've found in myself that it personally works really well for me if I have a goal outside of what is my main priority. So I can always reassure myself that I'm accomplishing something, and it's kind of an ego boost for me outside the lab that it, it's very easy to get down on yourself about experiments when they don't work out. So it's my way to ensure that I always have this like baseline confidence and baseline, you know, relaxation point that I can always come back to and say, well, at least I can do that. <laughs> it takes a certain amount of dedication, a certain amount of like willpower to do it. But um, like I wake up every morning at 4.45 to get to a 5.30 a.m. class. And that sounds really daunting for a grad student, but like honestly, that's the only time ever I have in the day. <laughs> so, and I've actually tried to work it out where, because, you know, I I'm obviously would like to not ever wake up early in the morning, but I have to. Um, so I did try for a while, like, trying to go in the evening, but it just, you know, obligations come up, your experiment doesn't work, things have to be optimized on the spot or troubleshooted on the spot, and so... I just found it more and more that it was least likely that I would actually get out in time if I left it up to the evening rather than do it in the morning. I know it's a way for me to ensure that whatever happens in the day, that at least like I have my personal time to myself and that's like never sacrificed. Because for me, like I get really anxious and um, moody, <laughs> if you will, if I don't have my personal time at some point. For me, exercise is relaxation, so that's why it's so important for me. My name is Vegas Summer, and I am a third-year grad student at UNC in the Department of Pharmacology. My time outside of grad school, I do Taekwondo. So I do uh, six, uh, six days a week, and I do two hours a day. Um, but that's mostly because um, I have to compete, and uh, that requires a lot of training. So for the competition, um, are spread out throughout the year. Uh, for the competition, it's called competitive uh, sparring or Olympic-style uh, taekwondo sparring. And um, basically, the training leading up to it is a lot of endurance, um, a lot of strategy. There's also the mental part where you have to be prepared for uh, a lot of flexibility and agility throughout the fight. It's like a chess game but um, it literally requires physical activity. <laughs> Taekwondo is, uh, I guess, a, f a form of martial arts. It literally mean, means punching with your feet. So, so there's a lot of kicking. And then for the competition part, so basically you score points by uh, delivering uh, a kick to the body or the head. One of the most important things I've learned is to be, I guess, under control and focused despite um, whatever's, whatever else is going on. So it's kind of teaching me a way to manage my stress. Um, so while I'm frustrated and, you know, I go to Taekwondo at the end of the day, um, we do, you know, a grilling workout and we punch and kick, um, you know, our targets. Um, at the end of the day, it's more about can you function under, you know, the stress you've been put under. So it's more 
like to help you focus your energy and not draw it away from you because, you know, for that day, you're just very frustrated. One of the things is it's helped me schedule my time because I do want to do Taekwondo consistently throughout the week. So that means that I need to make sure that I, you know, come in at the right time, do all the things I need to get done. So it definitely helps with the time management. Um, another part is that it's definitely like a good outlet for uh, stress relief because it's physical activity, you know, helps you stay active in grad school because that could be like very challenging at times. Um, and then in addition to that, it gives, I, I think it gives me like a competitive edge where I, despite if like something a lot is not working out, something to look forward to, if I have a competition coming up that, that I train towards. So um, part of, I guess, my reasoning to do it was um, there are going to be times where in grad school I'm going to feel like more of a failure than I should and, you know, have such a huge imposter syndrome. And I feel like if I'm accomplishing other goals so while I'm at it, um, it, won't, it will take at, at least some of the pressure off. So there's like this whole community besides the fact that we all work out together and can see together. So I guess I needed that extra outlet of it's not just grad school while I'm, you know, trying to succeed here. I should also have other successes in my life. So that's, like, you need to identify something like that that will help you be grounded while you're doing grad school. Yeah, those were cool interviews, Dan. A couple things that jumped out at me. One was something that both of them alluded to was the importance of having goals or senses of accomplishment outside of the lab. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. If if your entire self-worth is tied to some experiments, and we know that experiments don't go well very often, you're headed for trouble. Yeah, having your self-worth tied to experiments working out the way you think they should is not a plan for Rook, feeling mistake, good about yeah. yourself. So yeah, I thought that was cool. Uh, you know, that could go towards hobbies of all sorts uh, besides just physical activity. But I think that's important. The other thing I thought was cool was, man, talking to Tig, um, seems like she enjoys kicking and punching people. Uh, good life skill. <laughs> but you know, one thing I just found fascinating was... Uh, that she actually found the self-control of maintaining your composure while being kicked and punched at was it's a good kind of like being in grad school. Yeah, how that was kicked and punched. <laughs> that was directly transferable to um, the feeling of being kicked and punched by your results or your experiments. Usually, your while you're down, you're being kicked and punched. I <laughs> know. Oh, so uh, maybe that's our recommendation: is let people kick and punch you. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. Hello, PhD brand fight club. <laughs> That's right. The first rule about Hello PhD is tell everybody. Yes, that's right. Tell everyone you know about Hello PhD. Wow, Dan. Uh, so I would say those two take physical fitness to an entirely different level than I would even conceive of taking I, it. I wouldn't pick a fight with either of them in the cold room. No, no. I think either of them could uh, beat beat us up or probably lift us over their head. That's and, right. Uh, That's a little little more intense than I think a lot of people are, are ready for. Do we have something else to offer them? Yeah, so I thought what we could do um, was to, to take it back to the Lab Rat subreddit. So a couple weeks ago, Dan, what I did was I posed this question to the group and just said, hey, how do you find time for physical activity? How do you balance getting exercise and taking care of your physical health with the demands of of lab and your PI. Yeah. And, and one of the, the best suggestions that I really liked um, mentioned by ghost of Jeff Goldblum. I really love reading the names of Redditors. Um, <laughs> you just talked about, I take it. That's not his real name. It might be. It could really be the ghost or of her. Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> yep. Um, the suggestion was to buy a cheap bike and bike to and from lab. I, I know a lot of um, graduate students, postdocs live close to their university. Uh, a lot of these university towns, there's plenty of housing nearby get your exercise by biking in. And a lot of times you can find a shower on campus or somewhere uh, if, if it actually ha happens to be a pretty intense ride. But I love the idea of building it in to your transport. You got to get there anyway. It's cheaper. You're saving money. You're getting your exercise and, and you're making it a priority. Yeah, that's such a great suggestion. And actually several people mentioned the biking thing. And you're right. You've got to get to work anyway. And a lot of times, depending on where you live, you may even get there faster by bypassing traffic. So that's a great suggestion, Dan. Wear your helmet, please, though, because it is. Uh, and hopefully your, your town has bike lanes because you definitely want to stay safe. Absolutely. So what else did we get, Dan? Um, I, I like the suggestion from Dweed4. He said, um, paying for a fitness class at my school, it's super cheap because then you will not have any excuse not to go. And I think 
you know, universities particularly have these great resources. They have gyms and training centers, they have classes, um, and it's cheap because they are catering to students. So if you are on a campus, you're crazy not to take advantage of this. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Dan. A lot of places it's free uh, for students. And more and more, Dan, um, you know, it's become more popular, these group fitness type classes. And even if it's not on your campus, most of them give some sort of university or college discount. Dan, I actually started going to one of these about two months ago. And I'll say for me, it's been great because I remember being in graduate school and a couple of grad students and I would say, well, let's go to the gym. You sort of have this generic. It wasn't me. It wasn't you. Uh, well, I, I didn't go for that long. But, you know, you just say generically, let's go to the gym. And then you show up on you day stare one. stare at the machines. <laughs> like, uh, now what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> and you feel super intimidated. You do the butterfly machine because it looks so cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so, I don't know, Dan. I feel like a lot of times without any direction, um, especially if you're just getting started, um, you know, it cannot be the best experience and hard to stick with. But the thing I like about these classes is you go and it's really mindless. You just do what the trainer tells you to do. There are other people. And I find that I often push myself harder in a group than I do if I'm just kind of, eh, that was probably enough. Yeah, that that's, was that's five pound weight. That's pretty good. <laughs> I did three reps. That's right. I broke up a sweat walking over here. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's a, a great idea. Um, what else, Dan? Um I like the, I think along with that, and this is not one that, that we saw on Reddit, but I know a lot of people when we were in grad school did intramural sports. So people were on the softball team, they were on a uh, volleyball team, some people played basketball and you get with other students or other postdocs and you know, you exercise and, and people expect you to be there. So it's really easy to stay involved in something like that. Yeah. And I think that's great, especially if you're one of those people who just doing repetitive tasks in a room just is unbearable to you, like the treadmill or the elliptical machine. Um, I think playing an intramural sport can be great because there's a purpose. And I do think, Dan, a big part of why intramural sports are great is people are actually depending on you to be there if you're part of a team. So there's that built-in accountability, which I think is great. You can't accidentally not show up because they have noticed and they'll call you. Yeah, you know, at our university, Dan, they have intramural inner tube water polo um, I I was not invited to that. I uh, know that seems like something we could get into. <laughs> then the horse is drowned. <laughs> yeah, how do they find an inner tube big enough for a horse? That'll very, very I always difficult. wondered yeah. that. <laughs> Best joke in the book of a good a good polo joke. Um, so uh, speaking of stationary bikes and elliptical machines, one of the suggestions was if you're going to read a paper, um, why not do it on a on an exercise machine? So I don't know if everybody can concentrate. But uh, there are certain repetitive tasks that you do or, or things that you do that are very sedentary. Um, but you could add an exercise element as long as you're, again, staying safe and you're on a stationary bike or something like that. You know, Dan, I know something else you could do while on the stationary bike or the elliptical or the treadmill. What is that? You could listen to podcasts. No. You might fall off from laughing. <laughs> That's right. You can listen to the Hello PhD podcast. Listen to a more boring podcast. We don't want any <laughs> laughing-based injuries. Um, and, and another one kind of related and, and very lab-related, um, Gooey Mushroom mentioned doing little things in the lab like stretching or squats at the centrifuge. I don't know if you've ever tried this. You ever run up and down the stairs in lab just for the sake of it? or Well, you know, for a while in grad school, I would when I was going through these moments of feeling sad about how out of shape I was, uh, my lab was on the eighth floor in graduate school of our building. and so, There are very few one-story lab buildings. So, that's yeah. true. And so I would take the stairs every morning up to the eighth floor. Uh, and I would usually do that for three or four weeks. And then I would skip it one or two days. And then that was the end of that. But <laughs> and you let this be a reminder. Uh, anybody working in lab, go take the stairs. Then I liked one of the comments from CNM 3 d who said, I was lucky in my doctoral lab that my PI and lab manager cut out every day by 5.30 for gym time. It was amazing, actually, and they would be pretty good at dragging you to the gym. So one thing I think is cool is, you know, I think a lot of people inherently want to be more physically active. So maybe you can be the catalyst to start change that culture in the lab. Or maybe these are discussions you could have with other lab mates, something you could all do together as lab, maybe at the end of the day or maybe at lunchtime, you could all think of something active to do, even if it's just take a walk around campus. Yeah, keep it easy and accessible because if you if you make the hurdle too high, nobody will try to jump it. Yeah, you know, Dan, something that I've actually started doing in the last six months or so is 
I've started having walking meetings. And so if it's just a meeting where somebody was going to come over and we were going to chat about something, if it's a nice day out, we will have that same conversation uh, while walking across campus and back. Level two, skipping meetings. <laughs> that is This is the option. one where you frolic with the person you're talking with. Dan, I like this one. Reddit user Archie Ben said, Lately I've been using the New York Times 7-Minute Workout, which gives you all the exercise you need in one miserable, exhausting, but sub-10-minute workout. You know, I've actually tried that, Dan. I've done the 7-Minute uh, Workout. Is this like the... Gillette five blade razor <laughs> where everybody's aiming to get a, a smaller number of minutes in their workouts. Well, I've got the six and a half minute workout. That's true. It, it could be, but I will say, Dan, this, uh, I'm down to no minutes, <laughs> the no minute workout. This actually is pretty action packed. So you, uh, you actually do a different exercise every for 30 seconds straight. And then you take a 30 second break and then do another exercise for 30 seconds. It's pretty, are you supposed to do this once a day or like periodically throughout the day? Uh, it's up. That's the beauty of it is you can scale it. So you could start out doing once every other day, then you could do it every day. Then you could do it twice and do a 14 minute workout if you wanted to. Uh, actually some people in my office recently started doing this uh, a couple times a week together. What does it have to do with the New York times? I, th you know, I think they just, uh, I think that's where it gained popularity, this idea. And now, actually, if you go to the App Store from your favorite device, there are at least a dozen apps that demonstrate these different activities and count them down. But it's a good way to to really uh, get some exercise in a brief period of time. I can't be bothered to expend the energy of looking <laughs> up an app. <laughs> we will link it on the show notes to save okay. you the time. Thank you so much. So, Dan, I thought that was really helpful. I mean, I think, you know, obviously... Hopefully, we've impressed the importance of exercise. And I think the other thing that's important is just experiment, try some things, find what works for you. Hopefully, from all these things we read, we saw that people find ways to do this in lots of lots of different ways. Uh, and so, try stuff. And if you're not enjoying it, if it's not working for you, your schedule, and what you like to do, try something else. Yeah, find something you like because you're not going to stay with it if you hate it. If, if you like to be with people, make it social. If you like to dance, make it about dance. If you you know want to learn something about uh, fencing or taekwondo or whatever it is, uh, just really make it personal and don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Yeah, and if you've got some really innovative or cool way or something that works for you um, to stay physically fit during your grad school or postdoc experience, let us know. We'd love to, to share that with the Hello PhD listeners as well. So tweet at us, send us an email, and let us know how you stay fit in lab. Very good. Well, let's move on to the etymology puzzle. We had a lot of answers, a lot of answer responses this week. It was a busy week. We have uh, selected a winner. Let me tell you, let me reread the clue and then I'll tell you the, the answer to it. Okay. The clue last week was the horns of an impala are made of bone covered by this structural protein. And we did establish last week that that is not the car of the impala, but this is the animal. <laughs> the animal impala. And the answer, Josh, was... Keratin. Keratin. Which is also in horns and nails and feathers and uh, things like that. Kerato in the Greek means horn. So real simple one. Uh, the word horn is right in there. That was a direct translation of kerato and keratin. Is that where we get carrots like for diamonds? It's a good question. I'll have to look it up. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. A, a horn of diamonds would be nice, I guess. <laughs> a diamond crested horn. Yeah. I'm thinking of a cornucopia filled with diamonds. In any case, this week's winner was Justine from the University of Michigan. So congrats to Justine. Congrats, Justine. All right, Josh. Well, this week, I'm putting the puzzle on hiatus for just one week because as I was trying to come up with the puzzle for the week, uh, I actually found an interesting story that was related to our holiday theme. Oh, this is great. We have a, some poetry and now a story. An etymology story. So everybody has heard of Nicolaos of Myra who goes by the name St. Nicholas most of the time. A.K.A. St. Nick. Yeah, fourth century uh, Christian bishop who liked to give gifts. And over time, the church kind of recognized him every Christmas and they would give gifts to each other from St. Nicholas. That uh, sounds fun. Yeah, it is fun. And as he was kind of propagated throughout different countries and, and uh, different Catholic groups, his name got changed. So... Uh, Saint Nicholas became Saint Saint Nicholas, um, and it became Sinterklaas, and eventually it became Santa Claus. 
the transformation is complete. It is complete. But that's not the exciting part of this story. Um, that is where Santa Claus comes from, from St. Nicholas. But So Dan, is, are you saying that the way we got from St. Nick to Santa Claus was basically like a really long, terrible game of telephone? I think so, basically, through through many different languages. If you say it really fast, if you say St. Nicholas really fast a lot of times in a row, it'll start to kind of melt into... St. Nicholas, St. Nicholas, Santa Claus. There it is, see? You wow, it first. amazing. Um, if you said it with a, a more maybe European like St. Nicholas... And if I did it over and over for 100 years. In different languages. In any case... Uh, Santa Claus! <laughs> Was that your Swedish chef? I think that was, in, that was insulting to probably people. <laughs> but that's not really the surprising part. The, the thing that I found this week that I thought was really interesting was that during the Protestant Reformation in the 16th and 17th centuries, Martin Luther nails his 95 theses to the door of the church, and he says, look, Catholic Church, I don't like these things about what you're doing. And the Protestant uh, sect of the faith was born. Uh, but they really didn't want to venerate saints anymore. So St. Nicholas was, uh, you know, not somebody that they wanted to hold up every Christmas. Because he was a Catholic guy. He was a Catholic guy. He was a Catholic saint. And so uh, what they decided to do, the Protestants, was to, instead of exchanging gifts that came from St. Nicholas, why not exchange gifts that directly came from the baby Jesus? So let me get this straight. They definitely did not want to give up the gifts. Uh, definitely not. <laughs> The, the tradition needed to hold. You just had to tweak it a little bit. Gotcha. And so uh, he came up with, or, or they came up with, this idea of giving gifts from what they called the Christ child. And in German, this would be, um, I don't know if you, you've heard of kindergarten, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That means child garden in German. So uh, Christ child in German is Chris Kindle. Oh. Uh, over time, uh, Germans came to the United States, uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch, and they started calling it Chris Kinkle. And eventually it became Chris Kringle. That's where that came from. And somebody was like, Chris Kringle, that's got to be Santa Claus's name. And so now, you know, Martin Luther's doing his best to try and remove any reference to St. Nicholas. Uh, but they took this name, Christ Child, Chris Kindle, and gave it to Santa Claus. So I guess, I don't know, maybe nobody wins because Santa Claus is fairly secular. But it, it just it's this word puzzle throughout time as these people are trying to change people's opinions. Humans love gift giving. That's what we've learned today. That's a fascinating story. Or gift story. receiving, at least. Cool story, Dan. Thanks for that. All right, no problem. So I assume we will be back with another etymology puzzle next week. The puzzle is already in waiting. So we're giving your brain... Under the tree. You will unwrap it and enjoy. Well, we'll give your brains a break this week, but I think what we have given you is a cool story you can share if you're hanging out with family this week for the holidays. Uh, great episode, Dan. Uh I'm going to go out and take a jog around the block. I'll see you when you get back. Improve my mental fitness and stamina. I will walk slowly on a treadmill while I do my work. <laughs> on second thought, I think I'll just stay here and finish this salted caramel brownie brown ale. Yeah, thanks for picking that up. You know, I did try to get some eggnog, but the carton exploded, so I think it was not good eggnog. Yeah, that eggnog done turned. Hey, thanks to Tig and Nadia for taking a few minutes to talk to us today. Thanks to you for listening. And if you have any comments on today's show or you've got a potential topic for a future episode, you can email us, podcast at hellophd.com, or send us a tweet or connect with us on the Facebook page. Happy holidays, everyone. We'll see you next week. <laughs>